I'm sorry I haven't been able to join you earlier in the week. It sounds like you've had a really good conference. I looked at the, the topics, um, and I know that I would have learned a lot had I been here. I've been asked to talk about culture, natural, national identity, and foreign policy, and the role that non-governmental actors can play. And I'm going to look at each of those individually, with, of course, the United States as my case study, because that's what I'm familiar with. I'm assuming by this point you all know what cultural diplomacy is, what public diplomacy is, and you're interested in this or you wouldn't be here. Is that a fair assumption? Is there anyone who isn't familiar with the terms soft power or smart power? I can, everyone's familiar with those, that's great. I have to say that I was going to talk a little bit about public diplomacy in general, and then I got here five minutes ago and I picked up this wonderful um, magazine and started looking at this article on public diplomacy, seven lessons for its future from its past. And I think this is one of the best articles I've read, and I skimmed through it very quickly, but it looks like one of the best articles I've read about public diplomacy. If you haven't read it, I would say you should take a look. Um, as this article makes clear, one of the most important things about public diplomacy is listening. In fact, that's point number one here. We always say public diplomacy is dialogue. That's the diplomacy part. And the public part is that we're dealing with the public at large. Traditional diplomacy was government to government. That doesn't work very well anymore. For one thing, there are more and more democracies throughout the world, and in a democracy, the governments represent the people, so the people have to be educated um, about different issues or they won't vote for that government. So uh, if we want to work effectively with another government, we have to make sure that the people in that country will support that government's decisions or diplomacy doesn't work at all. Um, we, there are a lot of elements that are involved in public diplomacy and cultural diplomacy. It can include aid, humanitarian aid and assistance to different countries, either because of natural disasters such as a, an earthquake um, or during health epidemics where the U.S. is very involved in trying to reduce the cases of AIDS in Africa. Um, it can also respond to disasters of a political making such as the Luftbrücke here in Berlin. And is there anyone here who doesn't know what that was? You don't know what that was. That, that's my husband. I think he's um, trying to antagonize me. And I, if he's the only one who doesn't know what the Luftbrücke is, I'll tell him tonight over dinner. <laughs> for the United States, well, for the United States in Berlin, the Luftbrücke was really an important act of public diplomacy and a very successful one. Everyone who was alive at that time remembers receiving candy or basic staples or medicine during that period when the U.S. and its allies were, were flying in plane after plane um, with necessary uh, goods. But I think one of the greatest public diplomacy efforts ever was the Marshall Plan, where the United States worked together with European countries to rebuild those countries. We didn't just do this out of altruism. We did this, too, out of self-interest. It was very much in the interest of the United States to have a strong, economically prosperous, and democratic Europe. We needed this, uh, we needed a strong Europe to be our partner. So the Marshall Plan went on for many years. Many countries came out of the war and were able to rebuild themselves. Germany is one very successful um, example of this. We also made sure, well, we worked with other countries quite closely. Nothing was done unilaterally by the United States, but, we, but there were people in charge in each country who decided you know, what that country needed. Um, but we made sure that the governments that came out of this effort were reflected what were essentially American values. And I'll, I'll talk about American values in a few minutes. Um, but that was especially important to the United States. And because of this, we were able to have good conversations with these governments 
because we had a foundation on which to, to base our, our conversations. Cultural diplomacy now for the United States includes a whole long list of activities. It includes the educational exchanges and the cultural exchanges that have been going on for decades, although we don't have a lot of money for cultural exchanges. Um, it includes conflict resolution, um, education and training, everything from helping with basic education in countries um, where the educational standards are, are pretty low, um, to um, practical training for people, um, also encouraging students to learn how to debate openly and how to analyze information. Um, in public diplomacy, we counter misinformation. We try to advocate for tolerance and inclusion of people who are different for whatever reason. We might be teaching basic economics in some places, or we might be teaching advanced entrepreneurship skills. We cooperate with countries all over the world in um, countering climate change. We're trying to empower the disenfranchised, and we try and, and help people build respect for other people. So you, you'd think with this long list of issues that we're concerned about and activities we're engaged in that the State Department would place public diplomacy very high, and, and that would be reflected in the budget for the State Department. Right? Does that make sense? Uh, don't listen to my husband. He knows too much. Um, can anyone here guess how much of the budget for Germans ministry, uh, Germany's Ministry of Foreign Affairs goes toward cultural diplomacy? Anyone want to take a, a guess at what the percentage is? Would you like to take a guess? 70 million euros. 70 million euros. Yeah, do you remember what, I don't remember the figures, but do you remember what percentage? 25%? I was told 30%. Anyone want to take a guess at what percentage of the State Department's budget goes for cultural diplomacy? 5%. Have, have you already had a, people talking to you about this, or these lucky guesses? <laughs> <laughs> that was a lucky guess. 5%, that's absolutely correct. Um, I'm always telling my colleagues, my American colleagues, when they question the need for public diplomacy, I tell them to look at the website of the German Embassy in Washington and look at the events calendar. It's absolutely incredible, very impressive. I wish that that was the events calendar of the U.S. Embassy in, in Berlin. It's not. As I said, we don't have a lot of money for cultural events. We do a lot of educational programs, and, and the German government is a very strong partner of ours in our educational efforts especially. In fact, the German government contributes um, the majority of funding for the Fulbright program and some of the other exchange programs that we have with Germany. The reason that the U.S. government doesn't have a lot of money for cultural diplomacy dates back to the early 90s and the end of history. Does everyone remember the end of history or know about the end of history? Yeah, unfortunately, um, it really wasn't the end of history. And history has continued, and we still need money for public diplomacy. But it's always a, a tough fight, especially in these hard economic times in, in the United States. Um, so. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not going to pass the hat after this. We still do have, have money, but it's not what we would have liked. We'd like to be doing even more. I, I'd like to move on now to national identity, the second part of the, the title of this talk. There's a question in the United States, and I imagine other places, about how important it is to have a national identity. And that as I said, it's a question in the, in the U.S. now as well. In the United States, for decades, a century, more than a century, there was a very strong Anglo-Saxon or Judeo-Christian tint to our country. And our values came through Judeo-Christian values, the Enlightenment, the people who left Europe and went to the United States and founded it came from that background. Um, this began to change a bit in the 1850s when immigration shifted from France, England, Germany to Southern Europe and Eastern Europe, but it was still a Judeo-Christian country, not necessarily an Anglo-Saxon one anymore. Um, but since, in, since the beginning of the 20th century, 
We've had larger numbers of Asians, Africans, and now many Latinos or Hispanics coming to the United States. So that has changed the character quite a lot. I see that in Washington, D.C., where I've lived off and on for mm, almost 30 years now. Every time I go back, I need Spanish more and more, for example, and that you can't get change on a bus in Washington, D.C. if you can't ask for it in, in Spanish. And the, when I was growing up, we always spoke of the United States as being a melting pot where different groups came and assimilated, and in the end, everyone resembled everyone else, and the traditions all blended together. If you were Irish, you could still celebrate you know, uh, a German holiday, and everyone celebrates St. Patrick's Day, and, and you really couldn't tell one from another. I never thought about my friends backgrounds until really I joined the Foreign Service and I think, oh yes, you know, Litovsky must have been Polish or, you know, von Stauffenberg must have been German. But I didn't understand that growing up. Everyone was just an American. And that was the, the melting pot. 10, 20 years ago, we started talking about more of a salad where everyone is blended together, but you can still see the individual tomato or a piece of lettuce or, you know, the African or the Chinese or, or whatever. Now, I think people are talking, and I don't remember the phrase, the current phrase now, but it's more like a gazpacho where, you know, there, there's some soup, but there are still little chunks of individual vegetables. So um, that's what the U.S. is coming to resemble now. I looked at a recent poll, actually not so recent, 2004, that was done by National Public Radio, which, by the way, is on in Berlin, 104.1 in Berlin. It's a great radio station. If you're here in Berlin, listen to it. You could, in 24 hours, you'll learn an amazing amount of, about the United States. Um, according to this poll, two-thirds of native-born Americans think that the United States should remain a melting pot, but those are the native-born Americans. I don't know that that is actually what's going to happen. When we talk about the United States and its character, whether it's a melting pot or a salad or a, or a soup, we need to look at what the core values are. What, what is it that, that is our culture? What is the U.S. identity? What is our, our national culture? And according to a 2007 Harris poll, Ameri Americans see the American identity as involving um, individual and collective freedoms, those are very important to us, patriotism, rule of law, the primacy of the in individual, human dignity, equality, justice, a strong work ethic, and openness. In cultural terms, this is reflected in our music, our dance, theater, film, um, also in our universities, our museums, um, our tendency to be innovative and create solutions and new products. Um, I think you also see it in our natural beauty and the, the expanses of, of land that's been protected over the, over the last century or so. Of course, this is also reflected in our lack of gun control in many places, perhaps our unequal access to schools and hospitals, because while we do have some great schools, we also have some terrible ones. Um, as you probably know, we haven't had a, a nationalized healthcare system. We're slowly moving towards something where people without money will be able to get a better level of care than they have in the past. Um, and there are other things that you know are the sort of the flip side to our strong individualism and our, our um, patriotism and our sense of human dignity. So the national identity can be both good and bad, but there has been a, a sort of core national identity um, for most of our history. And when I'm talking about the good and the bad, and you know, I know that foreigners see the Americans differently than we see ourselves, and we might see ourselves as being really active in, in peace talks throughout the world, official peace talks, and really active in helping other countries. Other countries may see us as warmongers. And we know that we're the largest donor to the UN and, and other international organizations. Other countries see us as unilateralists. Um, there are all sorts of, of 
ideas about the United States that differ if you're talking to Americans, if you're talking to non-Americans. Um, according to another Harris poll, 84% of Americans think that there is still a unique American identity. How important is it for there to be a national identity? Does a nation need a core culture or a common spirit to survive? I don't know that there's really an answer to this. And I've served in places like India where there are a thousand different cultures. I don't know that anyone could, could possibly define what a core Indian culture might be. And on the other hand, there are places like Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia and the Soviet Union that fell apart, partly because they didn't have a core national identity. And you're probably also looking at Belgium. Well, we've all been looking at Belgium for many decades now and wondering what's going to happen there, where there are very strong regional identities and not a, a national one. We have regional identities in the US, too. We have the East Coast versus the West. We have North versus South. We have Texas versus the rest of the country. <laughs> we have California. And increasingly, we have the red states and we have the blue states. And those two seem to be, um, well, those differences between the red states and the blue states seem to be becoming stronger. It's not the first time that our concept of a national identity has been threatened, but there have been various influences um, that have been stronger in the last couple of decades that really may threaten the, the American image of a national identity. And the big ones are multiculturalism. As I said before, we used to be a, melt, multi, ugh, a melting pot, and now where you've moved away from that. Um, and there are lots of discussions in the states about how much assimilation is necessary. Some of you may be surprised to learn this, but English isn't even the official language of the US. We don't have an official language. There's been a lot of talk for the last 10 years about making English the official language. Um, there are many schools where people don't have the English level necessary to keep up, and schools have to react to that some way. Many places, there are bilingual schools. Um, other places are reacting in different ways. But language is a language is very useful in solidifying a country. Look at Belgium. But on the other hand, look at India, where there are 18 official languages and three, four, five hundred languages and dialects. Language doesn't have to be a unifying force, or it might not be essential. Uh, there's also globalization. Uh, many people in the United States now have contacts all, all over the world and are starting to see themselves as global citizens and less as American citizens. Um, and there's also the large influx of people from South America and Latin America. It's the first time in our history that such an enormous number of people speaking one language and with um, their cultures rooted in, in one single um, strain. It's the first time that we've ha had this experience. It's not just the southern states anymore, but there are large pockets of the United States, where, it, like Washington, D.C., where it really is useful to speak Spanish. Washington does not share a border with Mexico. It, it, people are not getting in, in boats and sailing to Washington, D.C. to escape Cuba. Um, you know, there are, there are pockets around the country that haven't had a traditional Hispanic population that now have quite large ones. By 2050, white people will absolutely be a minority in the United States, and maybe sooner than that. Now, 25% of the children under five come from Hispanic households. Um, by 2050, 40% of the children under five will come from Hispanic households. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, and the United States has evolved in nature throughout its history. Um, it, and we can't stop it, it's going to happen. There is a very good article in the current issue of the Smithsonian Magazine. You can find it online, just Google Smithsonian Magazine. Um, the July-August issue has a great article on what the United States will look like in 2050. And many people are predicting doom and gloom because of overpopulation, because of what this will mean for our natural resources. Um, and because of multiculturalism and, and other reasons. 
But um, this article says that the United States will prosper because of immigration. It will prosper because of the diversity of people who will be living there. They estimate it will be somewhere between 400 and uh, 500 million people at that point. And the author of this article, who's also whoop, has just come out with a book on the subject, um, says that we will be able to retain our unique common national culture. He doesn't define what that is, but he says that we will maintain it. I'm going to address culture, which is one aspect of this title, very briefly. And my, I want to ask a question first. How many Americans do you think go to a house of worship regularly? That could be a church, a mosque, a synagogue, or any other sort of, of house of worship. Any guesses what percentage of Americans regularly attend a, a religious service? Wow, I'm hearing 65, 50, 20. Uh, I have, yeah, I'll say when I was growing up, I knew maybe one family that went to church regularly, and I was really shocked when I left my hometown to discover that the United States is really a, a very religious country, and 50% of Americans regularly go to, to religious services. And that's an extraordinary number in comparison with anywhere in Europe. Um, how many of you would go to religious services regularly? Hmm. Well, that's about 25% generously. I'd say, I'd say probably more like 15%. So, you know, I've never, the question was, is there a difference between cities and rural areas? You know, I, I've never seen that broken out, but I lived on a street in Washington that was filled with churches, and the traffic jams on Sunday mornings were terrible. <laughs> that's the only time we had traffic jams. So, that's Washington, and part of that, um, well, I was going to say part of that is because Washington is still very southern, and, and southerners probably tend to go to church a bit more often. African Americans probably tend to go to church a, a bit more often. I'm just guessing. I haven't seen these figures. But the street also had Chinese Christian churches and Ethiopian churches. I'd go up and down the street, and I'd see services advertised in languages I'd never even heard of. And it, it was really quite a mixture. And as I said, uh, the traffic on Sundays was awful. We made the mistake once of inviting friends for Sunday brunch, and they never found parking, and we never did that again. Americans also spend 8 billion hours a year volunteering. And some of them are volunteering for religious-affiliated organizations. Others are volunteering at secular organizations, but 8 billion hours a year. And we also donate, we individual citizens, donate more than $300 billion to charity each year. And I think that those are very strong elements of our culture. Now, the final part of, my, of the title of my talk was uh, non-governmental actors. There are a lot now, and there are more and more all the time. I, I just wanted to mention a few that some of them are obvious, some aren't. And the first one, since I was talking about religion, are religious groups, and there are many missionaries, aid workers, human rights workers, teachers, and others who have been sent around the world by their churches or schools to help out in, in many different ways. Sometimes um, there's a little proselytizing that goes along with it. Sometimes it, there isn't, um, but they are a factor. There are also cultural organizations and organizers. There are traveling exhibits and performers. There, there are festivals, international festivals all over. One of the greatest international festivals is the Berlinale Film Festival here each year in February. Um, these all uh, cultural activities, of course, have an uh, influence on, on the public and are included in public diplomacy. There are universities. There are many universities, American universities, that have set up branches in other countries or that engage in exchange programs with other countries, sending their professors or students or exchanging research, cooperating in research. There are also now some excellent American universities, I think I just heard that MIT has joined them, that are putting up a lot of their resources online, uh, course um, syllabuses, the reading materials, their libraries online, so anyone who has access to the internet can um, take advantage of these, 
resources. There's the media, of course, and you know there are global television stations and radio stations. There's BBC, CBS, uh, CBS, BBC, uh, CNN. That's what I meant, and Al Jazeera, and there are others. Um, and of course, they have a, a great presence around the world and great influence. There, and of course, now there's the online media. Um, there are international NGOs that are not affiliated with religious organizations, and they're out there doing education, conf conflict resolution, human rights, all sorts of areas. And there are corporations and corporate associations. And um, you may or may not be surprised to hear me throw them in here, but in some ways they also have an influence on publics. Um, they may be contributing to cultural activities. They may be um, hiring people who get a sense of you know, the American work ethic. There are all sorts of ways that they contribute just by doing their jobs and also through corporate responsibility programs, social responsibility programs, cultural programs. Um, they raise the skill levels of people who work for them in some cases, or perhaps the pay levels. And of course, you know, there's some examples of corporations that have gone overseas that haven't left a very good impression. And I'm thinking of Union Carbide in India, but also BP in, in the United States now, and we'll see what happens there. Um, what I would say about all these non-governmental actors is they all have their own agendas and they're not necessarily working for the good of the U.S. government. They're not necessarily um, making sure that what they're doing is in keeping with our foreign policy. Uh, they may be spreading their religions or um, they may be out there trying to pick up paying students for their home campuses. They may just be trying to make a profit. So. Th non-governmental actors um, and public diplomacy, it's not such an easy fit. You have to examine that relationship and see what it is. And just as the United States doesn't engage in cultural diplomacy and doesn't you know, engage in humanitarian assistance solely because of altruistic reasons, um, but because we have a foreign policy goal, and so too these companies and, and other organizations also have their own goals. You, and, you know, we can't assume that just because we see Germans wearing Levi Strauss blue jeans or eating Ben, ben and Jerry's that they're going to support our, the German participation in Afghanistan or something like that. And we can't assume that someone participating in one of our cultural diplomacy programs is also going to support German participation in Afghanistan either. But we can hope at least that that person will understand why Americans are in Afghanistan and will be able to communicate that to others, whether or not he or she agrees with us. So uh, public diplomacy doesn't mean that we're all going to end up agreeing with each other, but the goal is to be able to communicate better and to understand each other better. Mutual understanding was the, the key word for decades in the United States. <clears throat> 